All right, welcome everybody. My name is Chef Amrita. I am the discipline leader. Don't bother. I will talk about spatial engineering and spatial IT as a pathway through university courses into a broader field of um, employment that is dealing with spatial information, collecting spatial information from a measurement perspective, managing spatial information, supporting decision making, developing services or systems in that whole breadth and range. I thought I will talk a little bit first about what this all entails, because it is a lesser known discipline, um, although an omnipresent career path in every industry sector. So I spent five minutes on what it is and then tell you how to study that. So, spatial engineers and analysts use science and technology to measure, model, and visualize our world. On the right hand side, you see a picture actually. Um, it is taken from a satellite. We have plenty of satellites uh, available in space that. Uh, uh, sensitive in different ranges of the of the light, uh, visible to um, infrared, and give us various information about what happens on the Earth's surface. That is spatial information taken from a distance, remote sensing. In this particular case, what you might discover in this uh, rural area are structures of uh, historic settlements. That is one application area of spatial information. <clears throat> but looking at the types of sensors that we use for measurement, it's not only satellites, it is plenty of things. So it starts with uh, traditional surveying, uh, user satellites, or in principle, all image based techniques to reconstruct uh, information, spatial information. It uses sensors that uh, track how people use energy or water or other resources, um, uh, tracking traffic, etc. And is used then, of course, for decision making in all these sectors. There is an aspect of talking where this is a sort of engineering that deals with information. It's, uh, Given that engineering is not a discipline at school, it might be useful to think about what engineering means and does, and, and how it differs from science, say. <coughs> Here's a short definition of uh, what engineers do. Engineers solve problems. And they do that even when they don't have, even when there is not enough scientific knowledge to solve the problem. So a scientist can solve a problem if there is a scientific solution to something. And an engineer is here to help if there is not or not yet the scientific knowledge available for a given problem. The traditional example, famous example, is the invention of the steam engine. That was invented long before Maxwell discovered um, the therm thermodynamic principles. So uh, there was a person being able to develop the steam engine even if they didn't understand completely the physics that was happening within the steam engine. The same I could claim is happening with maps. We are able to produce maps, useful maps, even if we don't know the exact shape of the earth. And why is that important? Because the shape of the earth is not a mathematical figure that we easily describe. It is a potato. <coughs> I thought I try to make it relevant for you by guiding you through a day of Jane. Jane is a fictive character working in an insurance firm, having a spatial background, being a spatial IT person, so she knows what she's doing, but the day for her starts as everybody else's life as well. Getting up early in the morning, um, turning the lights on, having a shower. And, well, there is already spatial information playing into this because power is working, water is working, heating is working, 
There are infrastructure providers that manage their networks with the use of spatial information, here geographic information systems, that make sure that there is, in times of varying demand, that at 7 o'clock there is a peak in demand on these things, that there is enough uh, water in the system and enough um, electricity coming. Jane is then catching the train in the morning, and of course, there is plenty of spatial information, engineering and IT behind the scenes to enable the trains to operate in schedule according to the current load, uh, foreseeing incidences, uh, managing uh, delays, etc., in a smart way. <coughs> At 9.40, she sits at a case at work and looks at a disaster that happened here in Sydney, a flooding. And of course, the insurance firm gets claims from people. Some of them are living in that area, so they may have justified claims. Some of them do not live in this area. That raises the eyeball of Jen. <coughs> so it is, again, spatial technology that helps decision making. There might be also other insurance customers living in that area that haven't made a claim yet, and Jane decides to give them a call and ask what's happening with their property. So, spatial technology. At 11.30, a consultant comes to this insurance company and shows them the software, 3D modeling software, actually 4D modeling software of exposure to sunshine or the ability to capture <coughs> Um, alternative energies from the rooftop. Um, and the question uh, that they are discussing here is if there is a new development in the city that uh, puts shadows on other buildings, does that have an impact on the value of the property? Are there responsibilities to pay to neighbors if they don't have access to um, solar energy any longer? So that, that is the insurance aspect of it. At 12.30, it's now chain goes for lunch and wants to meet with a friend working in another place. And of course, they both have one hour. They want to meet. They want to meet 40 minutes of that hour. That means they have a range of walking 10 minutes each. That is a spatial planning problem. And they use IT for finding a place where they can have lunch together. <coughs> at three o'clock, uh, chat at the water cooler. Um, and here's the interesting question, special question again. With autonomously driving vehicles, vehicles that trust the sensors built into the vehicle, if this vehicle produces an accident, who is the person or institution to? pay for it. Is that the car driver, who is in a rather passive role in an autonomously driving vehicle? Is it the vehicle itself? There is an ethical and a legal challenge for insurance companies that is unsolved yet. And what you see on the right hand side is a picture of what the vehicle actually sees. There are two cameras in front of uh, autonomously driving vehicles or of more expensive cars nowadays already two cameras, and one of that is shown in blue, one is shown in red, that's why you have that digital um, vision for us people. But the interesting bit is if you have images from two cameras, you get stereo your vision, and with stereo your vision, you have information about depth. The vehicle computes information about how far in front of the vehicle the objects are from the difference of the patterns of the red and the blue image. Spatial information, spatial technology. When Jane comes home, she opens her mail again without thinking much about the journey of this mail. But behind that is another feast of engineering. What you see here in the picture is an automatic sorting machine for mail. If you consider in what varieties people are writing, addresses on letters, uh, which variety of forms of, address, of your address, um, Australia Post is still managing to deliver, 
uh, uh, it would be? Well, perhaps thinking about the complexity of this, the problem that this machine has to solve. A lot of spatial reasoning by a machine in fractions of a second, matching of names, uh, matching of structures of how the address is written, um, and sometimes um, even resending to other addresses if people have uh, told Australia Mail that uh, post that they have moved. And quite a complex issue in a very short time. There are, by the way, <coughs> three official address data sets in Australia, and they are not compatible. So Australia Post has one. There is an official standard of addresses, GNF, that is the other one. And then some commercial company, I forgot who, has a third one. And they sell the addresses to customers for uh, address matching. So there are different ways of referring to addresses around. That's all what I want to say. At 10 o'clock, Jane checks in at her uh, favorite social media website and sees what her friends have done, uh, how the friends have spent the day, whether they were happy or not, or that can be done with spatial technology. So you see quite a broad range of sectors, markets, um, technologies where spatial information plays a role and where spatial information is making our decisions more efficient and helping for smarter solutions. Now we turn around the picture. We have looked at the very small encounters of Jane with spatial technology during her day. Here I'm looking at more global contexts. What you see here is the map of Haiti before the earthquake that happened a couple of years ago. Since Haiti is not a rich country, there is not much infrastructure, there is not much data around, it was a poor map. So when the earthquake happened, there was not much the international disaster relief agencies could use. No idea where the hospitals are, no idea where shelters are, no ideas about infrastructure. This is the map only days after. <coughs> Many people from around the world have participated in volunteer time to update the map on the left hand side with the help of satellite imagery in their spare time. And it was made possible by spatial technologies, by what we call volunteer geographic information tools that allow people, everybody, to contribute to spatial databases and to update them. Here, in an extremely short time frame, because there are tens of thousands of people involved in helping out. And uh, if you would rely in these cases on authorities, on governments, it would take them years to come to a similar result. Shared transportation might be one of the keys to address congestion in cities. We don't have one person in the car, but two or three persons in the car. We reduce the number of cars on the street automatically to the same number. <coughs> now, we are all familiar with taxis. We get now shared taxis from Uber Pool, say. Um, we may expect taxis without drivers. Sorry, there are some numbers missing. Somebody who copied my slides has missed the numbers. I was looking at prices. Taxi, $50 for a ride in the city. Shared taxi, half of that. Taxi without a driver. What do you think? How much will it get cheaper if the taxi drives autonomously? Five. The driver is the most expensive part of the taxi business. <coughs> Shared taxi without a driver fractions of five dollars, so I expect that it will become part of my key or more free to travel with these vehicles. That's the first autonomously driving bus that the School of Engineering has acquired last year. But autonomously driving vehicles do need accurate maps, and with accurate we mean maps that show everything that doesn't move in the environment. 
So it's not only who is the street. We are interested in the names on the street. We are interested in the street furniture. We are interested in every built, physically built um, element in that environment to help vehicles to navigate and to help vehicles to locate themselves in the environment. For that reason, the vehicle has accurate sensors, uh, control mechanisms, collaboration between vehicles. They talk with each other where they are, where they are heading to, what their speed is. That vehicle in front knows that it will uh, break in a second. It can't tell the vehicle following that it will break. That will make it all safer and so on and so on. Spatial information about, in this case, movement in the environment. <coughs> Here's another example, quite timely, if you came through Bretton Street this morning. Bretton Street is closed for uh, the tunnel construction, as are portions of Swanson Street or the contributors to Swanson Street. Um, <coughs> if you think about the challenge of building a tunnel from both ends of the tunnel, you would expect, of course, that they meet in the middle. And they do not should not only meet within a meter or so, they should meet within a sub-centimeter accuracy because directly behind the tunnel machine they already trade the tracks laid. And if the tracks have a jump, that's not, not good. The centimeter accuracy in an environment where there's no access to the outer world, where it's what? When it's dusty, is a piece of engineering surveying. That is a challenge, one of the large challenges of uh, our measurement technology currently. And then, of course, quite recently, a couple of weeks ago, there was news in the newspapers that a tunnel drilling exercise in Sydney some piece of infrastructure, high pressure gas fire. It was evacuated, broke in the city, it was evacuated. It was a, well, I don't use the word disaster because it could have become much worse, but uh, it has quite an impact on life. If you don't know that the infrastructure sunk in the ground is exactly, if you lose track where the tunnel drilling machine is actually drilling, and uh, that, that is another aspect of spatial information and use of spatial information. Here's another example. Um, agriculture is more and more becoming precision farming. That means the machines are knowing exactly where they are, and they do know from satellite images that I've shown before how dry the soil is, the soil and where to fertilize and where to water. Um, for that reason, this vehicle could also drive autonomously um, and uh, relieve the farmer from boring activities during the day. Second last example, back to my potato. People in our are interested in the shape of the earth and even if we don't know it, exactly because it's constantly changing. The ice caps are melting, that means less mass at the caps, more and more water in the oceans. That is a constant change. There's continental drift, that is a drift of masses in the body of the Earth that continuously happening. So what, what you see here is an approximation, still an approximation. It will always be an approximation, but we are getting better and better to determine this irregular shape of the Earth. And we need that because, well, for many reasons. Mapping was one example that I brought up earlier. The other example is if there are satellites flying around this body, and uh, if we use these satellites for positioning, but we do need to know exactly where the satellites are. While the satellites follow the gravity field. That means satellites don't fly straight circles or ellipses either. They fly according to this field. And we do need to describe the shape of the Earth and the gravity field of the Earth for these reasons. 
to the highest precision we can. Last example, big data analytics as a smart cities or smart precincts or smart buildings, doesn't matter the scale. Um, tracking whatever moves, whatever changes in this world by, multi by a multitude of sensors and applying data analytics to make sense of it, to predict it, to make us more resilient for changes, for interruptions in any sector. All right, that is a quick introduction to spatial engineering and spatial IT. I will give you a short overview of how to study it at the University of Melbourne and of course Interrupt me at any time if you have questions. There are reasons to do it at Melbourne University. Since you are in the room, I don't go through the details. You know what you are here. Um, we have um, internationally recognized degrees, accreditations from all over the world. Um, we have a university that is high in rankings internationally and high in reputation. We have therefore also lecturers that are leading researchers in the world and uh, share their knowledge in research inspired teaching. But if you then look at the structure, the University of Melbourne again is different from competitors here in Melbourne and comes with a so called Melbourne model structure where students study three years a bachelor degree and then two years a master degree before they get the professional qualification. In the case of special information that is either a bachelor of science or a bachelor of design, both of them have the identical set of spatial subjects in it, those major in spatial systems and they differ only in the other subjects that students can choose in their degrees. In the Bachelor of Design, these are design subjects, uh, subjects from urban planning, for example, or uh, from uh, environmental uh, modeling. In the Bachelor of Science, the other subjects are from sciences. So that is only about the mix the choice of the degree, but the core spatial information education is the same in both of if you choose to do the spatial systems major. And then you would proceed with a master. In the master space, we have two degrees. They are topic wise overlapping a little bit, but they are educating for different industries. There's the master of engineering and spatial which is a measurement science degree, if you want. Uh, a surveying degree for those who choose to specialize in surveying, but it's also photogrammetry, making measurements of your images. LIDAR, uh, land administration is an important component. Uh, Cadastra is an important component. <coughs> That's the master of engineering. And then we have a master of information technologies, this is for students who have more interest in the computational aspects in those uh, modeling the measurements in 3D and 4D, those who are more interested in data analytics, those who are more interested in developing systems or services for information for decision support. All right. If you're having questions about standard entry and graduate degree packages, ask me afterwards. All right, I mentioned already we have two pathways and they serve different industries. After the Master of Engineering, you typically would go into the surveying industry. After the Master of IT, you would typically go into the IT industry or in the consultancy industry or into the government. This slide shows the multitudes of industries that employ our graduates. And I hope or think, because there is this broad field of application that I mentioned before, you see that people can work in many, many, many different industries.